All right, welcome everyone to our first CDCR seminar of 2024. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our very own Dr. Richard Austin, a uh, lab writer of St. Joe's. He's a professor with McMaster's Department of Medicine in the Division of Nephrology. He's a career investigator of the Heart and Stroke Foundation of Ontario and is the director of the Hamilton Center for Kidney Research at St. Joseph's Healthcare. Uh, Dr. Austin currently holds the Amgen Canadian Chair in Nephrology. And in September 2022, he was elected to the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. In today's seminar, Dr. Austin will describe a misguided form of GRIP78 that acts as a driver of prostate cancer. Um, although considered to be an ER resident molecular chaperone, the Austin team and others have made the surprising discovery that GRIP78 is also expressed on the surface of many different types of human cancer cells. This insidious cell surface GRIP78 expression leads to the formation of anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies, which further contributes to disease progression in patients with prostate cancer. Consistent with these observations, the Austin Group has shown the following, that PCA patients often exhibit dramatically higher serum levels of anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies compared to age-matched healthy controls, I wrote this whole thing myself, by the way. Anti-GRIP78 autoantibody titers further increase with advanced stages of PC and PCSA levels, sorry, PSA levels, and three correlate with the development of metastatic disease and ultimately shorter patient survival. This implies that engagement of anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies with GRIP78 represents a more aggressive phenotype in cancer growth and metastasis. Based on these previous studies, they have now targeted this GRIP78 on cancer cells using an antibody-based approach that triggers cancer cell death and tumor regression. Dr. Austin will describe how this novel antibody approach represents a novel therapeutic strategy for the treatment and management of prostate cancer, as well as other cancers having elevated levels of anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies. So without further ado, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Austin. Thank you, Anthony. I'm glad I didn't give you the whole paper to, to read We've been here all day. So, um, so anyways, um, it's great to be here. Um, I thought, you know, I could either give you a boring scientific research uh, talk, or I could give you something of a little bit of entertainment. So, you're going to learn a little bit about geography, history, um, cancer biology, and a little bit of humor mixed in, I hope. Now, how come this thing's not going back down? Huh? I know. It might be the only slide. I'm trying. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'll put it on my cell phone. It was working perfectly. Just How there. did you do it? Just there. The arrows. No, I did hit the arrow. Okay. Anyways, sorry. Sorry about that um, glitch. But um, thanks for having me here. And I'd like to tell you about some of the work we've been doing with um, GRIP78 or glucose regulated protein 78 and its role in cancers, particularly in my lab, prostate cancer. And a lot of the work has been done by Dr. Ali Al Hashimi, who is in my lab as a PhD student. Um, some of you may know him now. He's a, an advisor at Pfizer um, for a lot of the uh, onco oncolytic drugs and oncology drugs that are uh, provided by Pfizer as well. And Bobby Shagan is a uh, chief of surgery at St. Joe's, and uh, he's a urologist who provides us with a lot of the, the samples that we need, for example, the autoantibodies, the blood from the, from the patients, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. So the other collaborators in this story is 
uh, Liz Pham from uh, Amgen in South San Francisco. I met Liz uh, when I was down there for a, uh, a sabbatical back in 2017, 2018. And I'll share, share a little bit of information about that. I've, we also work with a company called Atomwise, which is, has used AI to identify small molecules that bind to our target protein, GRIP78. This can be done for any target protein that you have as well. And Affinity Biologicals and Precision Biologic, I've been working with them to develop antibodies and ELISA kits for for GRIP78 or the autoantibodies to GRIP78. So if you need a real good antibody to GRIP78, there you go, it's right here, so. So anyways, uh, just a couple things. Um, this is one of my favorite movies, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, and one of the greatest scenes where he says, who are you so wise in the ways of science? And um, basically people ask me, well, what do you actually do for a living? Especially my neighbor across the, across the, uh, the road, he's always asked me, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I'm, I'm a professional beggar. I beg for research money, that's what I do. Then I give the money to other people. So it's sort of like Robin Hood. So, uh, you know, I thought I would just let you know that, uh, you know, I, I do have, or we have CHR grant funding. We have uh, currently three CHR grants um, that are related to my interest in cardiometabolic disease and the role of ER stress, endoplasmic reticulum stress, and GRIP78. And we recently uh, received a, a grant for another five years on this, these GRIP molecule, small chemical uh, compounds involved in regulating GRIP's activity or its expression. And just a couple things, I think people who do write CHR grants, uh, I've come up with this sort of proverb that a successful CHR funded researcher bears the scars of many unsuccessful applications. So people always say, oh, you're so, you're so successful in that. No, I'm one of the least successful persons ever because I write so many grants. And if you're lucky to get 20%, you're doing very, very well. And obviously any type of success is based on the lab that you have, the members of your lab. If you don't have a really good member or, or collaborators, you know, it's very difficult to get some important research funding. So that's really, really important. And the last but not least, we recently got a, a grant from the OICR on this antibody-based targeting uh, approach for cell surface grip for the treatment of prostate cancer. So relevant publications, we published a number of papers since 2017 related to this uh, idea, this technology, and this role of GRIP78. So I'll share some of the information of these papers and so share some of the preliminary data that we've generated as well. So just a little biology 101, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the cellular secretory pathway, which is involved in any proteins that are found in plasma, for example, or any surface proteins where they have to go through the endoplasmic reticulum, which is here close to the nucleus. And this is where the proteins fold and they have to be folded in their proper orientation. And then they have to be distributed. They have to either move out of the cell, either secreted or get to the cell surface as well. And this is a highly important process because you can think about protein folding. If the protein doesn't fold properly or if there are conditions that cause protein misfolding, that can cause a, a, a process called the unfolded protein response or ER stress, which has been involved in a number of human diseases. So in terms of the ER itself, just a couple interesting facts. Uh, the ER can constitute over 50% of the total membrane of the cell. It can occupy at least 10% of total cell volume. And it plays a number of important uh, processes in terms of protein folding, lipid biosynthesis, and carbohydrate biosynthesis as well. So in terms of the ER and the secretory pathway, so here we are here where the protein or the protein is a nascent polypeptide chain, which is the mRNA gets translated into this nascent polypeptide chain. It moves through the translocon. And when it gets into the ER, it's got to fold properly. It's got to get to this process here. And during that process, 
it's got to have poor glycosylation. There's probably disulfide bond formation. This is an ATP de dependent process. And there's a number of chaperones. So in this case, BIP is actually GRIP78, PDI, Calnexin. These are all ER chaperones, which help to allow the protein to fold in its right conformation. And if the protein does fold in its correct uh, conformation, then it's allowed to leave the ER and it's allowed to go to where it needs to go, either the cell surface or secreted or whatever. Uh, in terms of misfolded proteins, there's a number of conditions and agents which can cause cell misfolding. Uh, uh, just uh, mutations within the protein itself will cause misfolding of that protein. Although the protein may have correct functional activity and may be misfolded in such a manner that it can't get out of the ER. So it's not going to get to its uh, proper uh, uh, area within the cell or secreted outside the cell. And these misfolded proteins can activate a process called the unfolded protein response in cells. And this is a process that either allows to uh, have the misfolded proteins try to be folded in a proper orientation or allow to get uh, the misfolded protein out of the ER and degraded in the proteasome. So in terms of some of the facts, uh, concentrations of proteins within the ER is the most high in the cell. And you can get approximately 100 milligrams per mill of protein in the ER. Um, the synthesis rate can be staggering. So in terms of a pancreas or even the liver cell, we're talking millions of proteins that are going into the ER through these translocons every minute that have to be folded properly. And certainly not every protein gets folded properly depending on the co complexity of the protein. But it's very important to understand that if we didn't have these ER chaperones, you would have just a, a, a mess of proteins folding on top of each other. So in terms of the poster child for ER stress or ER stress function or structure is really the beta cell. When the beta cell differentiates into a plasma cell that generates lots of IgG, you can see that the ER completely almost engulfs the whole cell because this cell is programmed to generate protein, and that protein is IgG. So this is really the poster child for ER structure and function. Also, in terms of protein translation, as I mentioned, the ER, uh, the protein starts as a, as a single polypeptide chain. And you can think of this as, um, you know, paper uh, origami, where you've got this uh, single sheet of paper being folded properly in its right structure in order to allow it to either move out of the ER or function properly. And, you know, I used to read this uh, book to my kids when they were younger called Dinosaur Ben, and I could now understand why it's a single polypeptide chain. Because if the, the protein folded before it got through the translocon, you'd never get the thing through the translocon. So that's why there's a, this movement into the ER where it has to be folded within the ER. You can't have folding outside the ER to get through this translocon. It's actually a very good, a very good book too, if you're interested. So uh, ER stress caused by accumulation of misfolded proteins with the ER. I call it cellular constipation. Uh, it's a process where the cell gets constipated. The last thing you wanna be is more constipated. So you try to get rid of these misfolded proteins or refold them in the right conformation to get them out of the ER. It leads to the activation of this process called the unfolded protein response or the UPR, and it results in the increased expression of a number of these ER stress response genes or ER chaperones. And obviously GRIP78 is one that we studied quite a bit and leads to a general decrease in protein translation. So one of the arms of the pathway called the PERC pathway causes general protein translation to be shut down. And the reason for that, as I mentioned, is when you're constipated, the last thing you want is more protein going into to the ER to cause more constipation. So in terms of agents and conditions that can cause ER stress, I, one of the simplest things you can do is you can throw DTT or beta mercaptan ethanol 
on the cells and that'll disrupt disulfide bond formation and cause ER stress. Um, there's certainly uh, ER calcium depletion agents like uh, thapsigargin, ionomycin, uh, glycosylation antagonists like tunicomycin, for example, and any conditions that affect glucose starvation and also um, a number of pathological states that can, law, that can affect protein folding and obviously misfolding proteins or mutations within the protein that you're interested in. And also, if you reduce the expression of some of these chaperones, you're obviously going to cause some type of stress as well. So in terms of the UPR, as I mentioned, just very quickly, there are two, there are three arms of the UPR. One is the PERC pathway, which leads to the attenuation of translation. And the two other pathways, the ATF6 pathway and the IRE1 pathway are involved in upregulation of the ER chaperones to try to compensate for this misfolded of proteins. And what's very interesting is that BIP, or in this case, GRIP78, it normally sits on these three arms. It sits on PERC, it can sit on ATF6 and the IRE1 molecule, and basically keep it in a dormant state. Once you start causing ER stress, what happens is that uh, GRIP molecules will now move to the misfolded proteins, and then these pathways are activated. So there's a real interesting connection between protein misfolding in the ER, movement of GRIP, and activation of the UPR. So importantly, I play a lot of hockey. I mean, it may not look like it, but uh, uh, ER stress is like hockey. So I know many people 10 years uh, ago would listen to this talk and say, I remember those hockey uh, slides. So if you can remember this, that's a good thing. So this is normal rink homeostasis. This would be like inside the endoplasmic reticulum. And here's the ER chaperones here, the striped individuals uh, in, the, in the rink themselves. Now, this is player-initiated misfolding. So if you ever ran into a goalie, this would cause a lot of player misfolding that would, that would occur. And then you get this stress-induced player aggregation. And you can actually see some of the chaperones here trying to refold this mess of bodies on the ice. And then eventually, if you can't get it refolded, you get player retranslocation and degradation into the penalty box for five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever. So that's the connection that I see between hockey and ER stress. So in terms of GRIP78, this glucose-regulated protein or heavy chain binding protein, um, this is Amy Lee. Amy Lee is the queen of GRIP78, all great things that GRIP78 does. She was the one who originally cloned the gene. She's the one who originally made uh, expression vectors, knockout mice. So she's done the lion's share of work in GRIP78. And she's just a great lady. Uh, she's 75 and just keeps chugging away and uh, really just a, a super person to be around. So in terms of GRIP78, the gene is the HSPA5 gene. It belongs to the family of heat shock proteins, but GRIP78 and other members uh, in the ER are not heat shock proteins, okay? They are completely different. They're more involved in reductive stress than oxidative stress. Um, Again, ER molecular chaperones uh, is, is GRIP78. It translocates nascent polypeptides into the ER. It's involved in correct protein folding and transport of correctly folded proteins to the Golgi is important. And it's, an, it's the initiator of the UPR, as I mentioned before. It moves from the accumulation of misfolded proteins. It moves from those three arms of the UPR to those, uh, to those other uh, misfolded proteins in the ER. So if you wanna look at GRIP or if you wanna stain for it, there's a bunch of antibodies out there that you can use. And this is a typical staining for perinuclear staining for GRIP78 in cells. If you wanted to, you can make a GFP GRIP78 construct or a GFP PDI construct or Calnexin construct. So if you wanted to put something in the ER, you can certainly use the signal peptide that all of these molecules have and hook it up to your protein. And you can have a, a tag like GFP if you're interested. 
So in terms of the 3D structure of GRIP, it has a number of very important structures. Uh, certainly it's got a signal peptide that, that uh, directs the protein into the endoplasmic reticulum through the translocon. It has an ATPase uh, domain, which is involved in the ability of GRIP to bind misfolded proteins. And upon ATPase hydrolysis, it, it releases from the protein, allows it to fold a little bit more, and then comes back and binds it. So it has a peptide binding domain uh, in the protein itself. That's the, the area where it binds to the uh, unfolded protein, most of the hydrophobic domains of the protein. And then it's got a KDAL retention sequence. So this retention sequence allows the protein to remain in the ER. So you can, you can see why you would want something like that. There's a KDAL receptor, which captures the GRIP78 and keeps it in the endoplasmic reticulum. So it's not secreted out all the time. So the cell doesn't have to make continually making all these ER chaperones. If it's got a, a capture tag, like a KDAL sequence, it remains in the ER. And importantly, GRIP78, like most of the, the ER chaperones, are calcium binding proteins as well. And again, you know, because it's an ER chaperone and it functions in protein processing, there's a huge number of studies that have shown these correlations between a number of human diseases and cancers and its relationship to, to either uh, you know, diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, certain cancers. It's likely all related because it has such this wide scope effect on a number of proteins because it, it is a chaperone which directly affects the folding of a bunch of other proteins in the cell. So in terms of its cellular function and localization, um, over the years, the vast majority of work has been really the role of ER grip, the, the, the grip 70 that's found in the endoplasmic reticulum. But recently, particularly in the cancer field, the surface GRIP78 has been a very important player uh, in terms of disease progression, also in terms of autoantibody production. I'll get into that as well. And it's the cell surface GRIP that you normally do not see at all on normal tissues. Okay, So pathological tissues like, say, Atherosclerotic plaques, we've published on, we show cell surface grip. Fatty liver disease, we showed cell surface grip. And certainly in, in cancer, it's well known that these ER chaperones somehow move to the cell surface. And it's likely because of the fact that either the KDAL receptor is, is uh, either bound up by some other protein, or maybe there's so many of these chaperones being synthesized that you know, the whole uh, uh, KDAL receptor is being sequestered and then allows for these proteins to get to the cell surface. So there's a lot of interest in how that actually happens because it's important. If you can stop it from getting to the cell surface, you might be able to stop some of the signals that cause a lot of these pathological effects. So in terms of uh, GRIP and its role in cancer and a driver of cancers, of certain cancers, uh, in terms of cell surface grip, um, there's a lot of research that's been un, done already to show that GRIP78 can interact with uh, G proteins on the surface. There are a number of cellular um, um, ligands for GRIP78, like alpha-2 macroglobulin, crypto, which can bind directly to GRIP. And depending on where these uh, ligands bind, they can either do a number of things. They can cause an increase in cell proliferation, or they can actually cause an effect and, and activate apoptotic pathways. And normally it's the N-terminal. So, so compounds that can bind to the N-terminal domain of grip on the surface, increase cell proliferation. Compounds that bind to the C-terminal domain seem to cause this apoptotic effect. So, this is what we know about cell culture studies that have been done in some of the animal studies as well. Um, in terms of GRIP78, you may want to know where did this come from? Like who actually studied this and why? Well, initially these were done to look at some protein profiling. So this is a JBC 
paper back in 2003. And what they did is they did biotinylation of cell surface proteins and, and basically pulled them down with streptavidin and looked at the profiling of, of the proteins to find out what were they grabbing off the cell surface? What's on the cell surface of tumor cells that you don't see on norm, norm, normal cells? So this is uh, one of the original papers where they used the biotinylation streptavidin approach. And here's a, a number of a bunch of proteins that they identified on different uh, tumor cells. And you can see here with the arrows, there's a whole bunch of these ER chaperones that seem to escape the endoplasmic reticulum and get to the cell surface. So this was also uh, an interesting paper by Wadi Arap and Renata Pasqualini, who I actually collaborate with. And back in 2002, they uh, used a peptide phage display approach to pull down autoantibodies in cancer patients that weren't found in normal plasma, okay? And what they were able to show is they were able to show that they identify a, a prob in that paper, I think probably seven or eight autoantibodies, which were strictly found in the patients with prostate cancer in this case, that were not found in normal plasmas. And what they did is they took those antibodies, purified them, and then identified how these antibodies, what, what is the target protein that they, they were able to interact with. And with this one here, for example, this is, the, um, this is the phage display peptide that captured this autoantibody. And this autoantibody was against cell surface grip, which they had no idea what it was involved in, but they were able to capture an autoantibody from plasma from uh, prostate cancer patients. And then they showed that in terms of the probability of survival in patients, that patients who were positive for the autoantibodies had a lower uh, survival rate versus individuals who are negative for these um, autoantibodies to GRIP78. And then they also showed here, they're shown able to show that in prostate cancer patients, whether metastatic um, or locally advanced uh, prostate cancer, they were able to show that these patients had autoantibodies to GRIP78. And again, they were able to show in this cohort of patients an increase in uh, or decrease in survival uh, with respect to the autoantibody tires. And then this one from, uh, from Sal Pizzo's lab and uh, Mario Gonzalez, who I also collaborate with, they were able to show that these autoantibodies can induce prostate cancer cell proliferation. So what they were able to show initially is they looked Using the GRIP78 autoantibodies that they purified from patients, they asked the question, if we take a number of uh, different cell types here, prostate cancer cell lines, and look for what cell lines have more uh, cell surface GRIP versus cell lines that have very little. And you can actually see here, there's LN1 LN cells, PC3, DU145 cells, which we use in the lab, uh, and a whole bunch of other cell lines as well. And what they showed, interestingly, is that in the one LN cells, if you add these autoantibodies to these cells in culture, you get this spike in calcium release from the endoplasmic reticulum. And I'll get in a little bit more detail when we talk about the work that we've done. And then what they showed is that this is also related to proliferation of the cell. So again, I just took these... Uh, this uh, image here and, and put it with this to show the cells which had the most cell surface grip had the most increase in proliferation uh, in terms of its uh, interaction with the autoantibodies. So you can see here, these cells here don't have virtually very little cell surface grip. And obviously they're not proliferating in the presence of the autoantibodies. And then last but not least, well, it's never the, is no way last but not least, but this is a paper that recently came out in Nature Communications showing that cell surface grip now is considered an important target for CAR T cells. And there's a number of groups that are looking to utilize cell surface grip on tumor cells. And again, they were also able to show 
quite nicely that uh, that um, um, this would be in a mouse model, obviously, but survival of the mouse models were increased when you were able to use cell surface grip to capture and to attract uh, CAR T cells uh, to the tumors. And here's a, a company called Bold Therapeutics. They're a company found in uh, Vancouver, BC, and they have this small drug here uh, they call Bold 100, which is basically a ruthenium-based therapeutic, which has been shown to directly uh, interfere with GRIP78 expression. So this can transcriptionally knock down GRIP78 expression in tumor cells. And they've done uh, some trials, some uh, phase two trials recently and showing that there seems to be some advantage of targeting GRIP78. What's interesting is this is really the only compound after about 20 years of research. And Amy Lee says that this is really the only compound that they've been able to identify as sort of a, a, a drug that could potentially be used to reduce GRIP78 expression in tumor cells. She says it's, it's, it's pretty disappointing based on all the work that's gone on to this uh, in this area. So this is a company out of uh, Vancouver, BC. Now, this is for Karen Mossman. Uh, also, GRIP78 has been shown, cell surface GRIP78, to act as a viral entry point uh, for SARS-CoV-2. So um, we have also been working on this, but there's two, three papers that recently came out. Actually, Amy Lee's group showed that uh, that cell surface GRIP is involved, and there are specific inhibitors of GRIP, one's called HA15, which is an ATPase inhibitor of GRIP78, which can block this uptake of, uh, of SARS-CoV-2. So this is another area of interest as well. And what's really important, and I didn't mention before, is that ER stress alone, like viral infection can cause ER stress, and ER stress alone can also increase the amount of cell surface GRIP, okay? So ER stress also increases surface grip, which also could act as a, as a real uh, negative feedback or a positive feedback to cause even more cell injury. And then here's a paper that we published probably about four or five years ago. And we, we basically had this idea of these autoantibodies. How are these anti autoantibodies working to cell surface grip? How do they cause this cell proliferation? And what are they uh, basically the cellular uh, targets or the cellular components that are involved here? So we use in our, in our cell culture studies, in our animal studies, we use DU145 cells. And as I mentioned, the reason we use them is because they have cell surface grip. And we use the nod skid mice to look at tumor growth uh, in, these, uh, in terms of the role of cell surface grip. So one thing that we did initially is we looked at prostate cancer grade and its correlation to GRIP78 expression and anti-GRIP78 autoantibody titers. So if you look at uh, uh, sections from patients with either grade one, grade two, or grade four uh, prostate cancer, you can see when you stay in for GRIP78, a significant increase in the expression of GRIP78 in these uh, tumors. And what's most important is you also see a significant increase in cell surface grip. Now, what we did is we looked at the uh, anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies and their correlation uh, with PSA. And we showed there is a positive correlation uh, with PSA in these patients. And we also showed that if you take a look at the autoantibody titers, they significantly increase over our controls and they also increase versus the uh, levels of PSA. And what was also interesting, Bobby was able to get us some plasmas from patients who had already undergone a successful surgery. And six months post-op, we were able to measure the autoantibody titers in these patients, and they were significantly decreased in these individuals as well. So what did we, what did we do to try to figure out what's going on here? Well, we showed that the autoantibodies themselves in red here significantly increased tumor size. 
So these are autoantibodies that are purified directly from patient uh, plasmas. And these are autoantibodies that target to the N-terminal domain of GRIP78. And in most patients, the vast majority of autoantibodies, about 85 to 90% are against the N-terminus of GRIP78. So we've got PBS, IgG control, anti-GRIP78 autoantibodies, and consistently we see, and others have seen this too, that the autoantibodies dramatically increase uh, tumor growth in these, in, in these tumors, uh, in the mice. And then if you look at tissue factor, which is uh, a molecule which is involved in coagulation, but it's also involved in tumor growth, is that you can see also with tissue factor, you can see a significant increase in the expression of tissue factor, which is a cell surface protein involved in, um, in, th in uh, the generation of thrombin. And what we did is we did some back then, we did some, uh, um, not RNA-seq, but it was a nanostring. And we looked at VEGF, uh, spliced XBP, which is a marker of ER stress, GRIP 780 ER stress, CHI 67, ATF4, which is a, a marker of also ER stress. So you can see that the autoantibodies activated a number of these UPR uh, molecules and also increased the proliferation, markers of proliferation uh, in these cells or in the tumors anyways. And then what we did is we asked the question, well, if tissue factor is really important, why don't we generate uh, cell line, a stable D145 cell line, which has decreased tissue factor level or expression. And this is what we did is we show this uh, cell line number four, which we call D145 knockdown KD. And we generated the, the cells and we showed that if you look at a tissue factor procoagulant activity assay, you can see that um, in the presence of the autoantibody in wild type cells, you get a nice activation in cell line number one, which has probably about a 30% level of tissue factor. You can see it also goes up, but not to the same extent. And then the cell line with no tissue factor, the activation is basically blunted. And then what we did is we looked at uh, tumor growth and we were able to show that the DU145 uh, control, GFP control versus the knockdowns um, basically, the knockdowns had uh, a lot less ability to, to grow in these, in these animals. And we showed also in the tumors that the expression of tissue factor is significantly reduced, both uh, with uh, IHC and both with, uh, with uh, blots as well. And then what we did here is we looked at the tumor volume in terms of the anti-GRIP78 autoantibody effect in these uh, cell lines. We showed there was really no effect, which suggested to us that tissue factors required for the ability of these, anti these autoantibodies to activate the proliferation of these tumors. And also what was important is what we did is we took the serum of these individuals. When you take the serum and you add it to the cell culture, the DU145s, you can see that uh, it's very uh, consistent with the purified autoantibodies you get this activation of tissue factor. But if you deplete those autoantibodies, there's nothing left in the serum that can activate tissue factor. So what we got out of these studies is that this is a tissue factor specific effect, and it's only activated by the autoantibodies. There's nothing else uh, in our case in the serum that activates uh, uh, the tissue factor in these tumors. And then what we did is we showed that um, heparin or enoxaparin, which are, are used for uh, thrombotic disease to reduce thrombosis, um, we used them because there was a paper way back in 1978 or something that basically utilized heparin as, as a molecule to purify uh, GRIP78 from tissue or from lysates or whatever, because back then we didn't have molecular biology to overexpress and make as much protein as we wanted. So uh, what they used to do is use a heparin column and they were able to purify uh, these different chaperones because they would bind. And what was really interesting is that uh, 
where heparin and enoxaparin bind is exactly where the autoantibodies bind, around 98 to 115 in GRIP78. So we thought, okay, well, let's see if we can interfere with the ability of, of the autoantibodies to bind to use using enoxaparin or heparin. So first, we just uh, did some cell culture studies where we showed uh, Thapsigardin is just a control that shows that we can get activation of tissue factor. But if you add heparin, nothing really happens to drop it. But if you look at the autoantibodies plus heparin, you get the sig significant drop. We also showed that anoxaparin and heparin at a dose-dependent effect cause this reduction in the tissue factor activation of the cells. And then what we did is we took cells and we looked at cell surface grip and we looked at the ability of the autoantibodies to bind. And then we added the autoantibodies plus heparin or anoxaparin, and we shot, saw a significant reduction in the ability of the autoantibodies to bind to cell surface grip. So this is one approach that we use to say, hey, you know, maybe there's something out there we could use to interfere with the autoantibody to cell surface grip. And then importantly, if you looked at the anoxaparin effects, you can see that if you treated the animals with anoxaparin, here's our control animals uh, here, and then the animals with the autoantibodies. If you add anoxaparin, you can see that in the autoantibody treated group, the size of the tumors is significantly reduced back to normal levels. So this implied to us that the heparin or anoxaparin that we use was interfering with the ability of the autoantibody to bind to surface grip to increase proliferation. Now, it doesn't stop it. I mean, the tumors still grow in the mice, but it certainly significantly reduced it. So what we had here is a, a model system where the autoantibody binds to GRIP78 on the cell surface. And I didn't show you the biochemistry, but it leads to IP3 le increased levels of the cell. That causes opening of ER channels in the, uh, in the endoplasmic reticulum through the IP3 receptors. And then that leads to increased calcium uh, release and that can cause UPR activation. It can also increase tissue factor activation and that can lead to increased tumor angiogenesis or increased tumor proliferation. So that's the model system that we put forward. And there's a couple of grip groups that actually uh, confirm this uh, model system as well. So in terms of our preliminary data with this antibodies um, that we've got from Amgen, and Amgen is a, I, as I mentioned, I did a, um, um, I was there for a year for a sabbatical. And I'll tell you how we got the antibodies, what they are, and why they're so intriguing, and why we're following this route with this dual antibody autoantibody and this recombinant antibody that we have. And then I'll give you some information on our cell culture mouse experiments. But in terms of Amgen, uh, back in 2017, I lived in a place called Moss Beach, which is just south or just north of uh, Half Moon Bay. It's about a 20 minute drive to Amgen in South San Francisco. So this is South San Francisco. This is the birthplace of biotechnology an amazing place. Um, it's certainly not in San Francisco itself, but this is where all the big pharma companies are located. And here's Amgen in their small little uh, uh, site in uh, South San Francisco. There's like five gigantic buildings here. And apparently it wasn't big enough, so they built a new building just across the street. I don't know why, but anyways, the point is, is that this is where their uh, site was located. And this is where we live, like five minutes from Moss Beach. And, you know, this is a, a seal reserve. We used to walk down the, uh, the uh, near the Pacific Ocean every day. Just an amazing place to be. Uh, this is uh, 45 minutes from here. We're in Half Moon Bay. And this is where the Mavericks Big Wave Invitational Surfing Contest is. So if you want to see crazy people on surfboards in January and February, that's where they're all. They're always looking for this Mavericks Invitational uh, Surfing Contest to happen. Um, paddle boarding, you know, just like five minutes away. That's not a seal. That's me. <laughs> the fog in uh, in uh, San Francisco. I mean, the fog 
the worst times to go, you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm a travel agent, but I'm just going to tell you the worst times to go to San Francisco or go to the coast is August and September, because that's when the fog rolls in. And if you climb up the mountains, so this is where we would live somewhere in the fog. And if you climb up these mountains, well, hills, whatever you want to call them, where there's no fog, it's like 90 degrees. When you go back into the fog, it's like 55 degrees. So it's just horrible. Any other time, September to November, December is a great time to go. Uh, this is across the street when there's no fog. Uh, my son Adam and I went for a hike. Um, this is a banana slug from Butano State Park. Don't eat that thing. You know, the more yellow they are, the more toxic they are. So just leave them alone. Uh, this is uh, Redwoods in Butano State Park with my other sons, Adam and, uh, and our Alex and Andreas. So those are pretty big trees. But this is an even bigger tree, 45 minutes away, Sequoia National Park. And that's a big tree. And then Simon Jackson from Amgen, he led the whole uh, PCSK9 project in Amgen. And then Bill Richards, who uh, led the cardiometabolic disease group. We had a great time at Amgen. And this is the iconic coffee machine at Amgen. You don't just get pots of coffee like that. You get this crazy machine that can give you cappuccinos and whatever you want, you can get it from this machine. And then this is the last evening uh, when we left uh, in the, a year later from Moss Beach. So you can see really see why I was eager to get back to Hamilton and then leave San Francisco. So back to the, the science, this is a, a, an antibody called PAT-SM6. It's an IgM antibody. And this antibody was discovered many, many years ago in a patient with, I believe, gastric cancer. And uh, they were able to show that this IgM antibody actually bound to cell surface grip. So what Amgen did, Amgen had a program, or they still have a program on CAR T, tel, CAR -T cell program. And they had identified cell surface grip as one of their lead surface molecules that they wanted to interrogate. And um, they decided that, you know, at, in a company, it's always uh, science versus money. You know, what, what is the company going to do? Is this going to give us money or what, what targets should we be pursuing and all that type of stuff? So, you know, so they had cell surface grip on their radar screen and eventually they just said, can the cell surface grip, we've got another surface marker, which we think is better and so on and so forth. But anyways, this PAT SM6 is an IgM molecule. And as you may know, IgMs have these five uh, spikes, uh, IgGs or I, you know, immunoglobulin spikes associated with it. So what Amgen did, and this was just a, uh, a research tool that they gave us. So um, basically what they did is they took uh, the spike and they cloned it into um, 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 the mouse IgG background so they could use it in their mouse studies. But again, they canned the program and they said, oh, you work on GRIP-70, would you like to use this for something? I said, well, I don't know, we'll, we'll take it and we'll see what we can do with it. So we just got it and uh, brought it back to Hamilton and uh, used it in some experiments. So I'll tell you what we did. So this is one of the first experiments that Ali did in the lab with the mice. And he looked at tumor volume and this was complete surprise to us. So what he did, so here's uh, the autoantibody. Um, over time, you can see the tumors progressing, which is what we expect. The IgG control, the recombinant antibody. So that's that hybrid antibody we got from Am Amgen alone. Didn't really do too much, but we know that it does reduce tumor growth uh, over time, and I'll show you that data. But what was striking and intriguing to this was the autoantibody and the recombinant antibody together. When you put them together, after a week, we didn't see any tumors anymore. They were gone. So what he did is he took the mice and he looked to see where the injection sites were. So here's an average you know, tumor that you would find in these mice after five weeks. And then here's what would happen when you added the antibody autoantibody with the recombinant antibody. 
And this was probably one or only two of the, the tumors that we actually saw, they were virtually gone. And, you know, so this was quite intriguing to us. And he also showed that if you did some histology and you stain for CHI-67, you got a significant increase in CHI-67 staining with just the autoantibody, but with a combination, you saw a significant increase in necrosis of the tumors. So then what we did is we did a larger study, uh, a lot, uh, many, many more animals with the autoantibody plus or minus the recombinant antibody and IgG controls. And what we see is virtually the same type of thing. We have the autoantibody here alone, and then we have the IgG control, and this is consistent with what we've seen before. This is actually the recombinant antibody alone over time. It actually does go up, but it takes a lot longer uh, than the, the eight weeks that we see here for the IgG control. And if you just left the autoantibody alone, it would just spike like this. So the tumors would grow very, very fast. But when we added the recombinant antibody at this time, seven weeks, we saw within a week, two weeks, about an 80% regression of the tumor, which was amazing to us. And we would have gone a little bit longer, but we, but we didn't have enough of the antibody at that time. We now have more from Amgen, so we'll see where that leads to. But this was quite exciting because nobody had ever shown the, a double antibody like this would, would happen. And this would actually make sense for patients who are, already have the autoantibody. You know, we know prostate cancer patients walking around with these antibodies. Could we use something to actually cause tumor regression with the autoantibodies already there? So positive caspase staining in the tumors. Uh, we've got tunnel positive staining. We showed a significant increase in the staining. Um, we then looked at DU145 cells, and we showed that the autoantibody plus the recombinant antibody reduced tissue factor procoagulant activity. So here's our thapsigargin control. Here's the autoantibody alone. This is the recombinant antibody. You put them together, you get reduced tissue factor procoagulant activity. Um, again, here you see that uh, proliferation is also affected. Here's um, uh, the autoantibody where you get increased proliferation, but you add them together, you get a reduction. Um, we saw cytotoxicity also increase with the autoantibody and the recombinant anti antibody together. And we also showed P53 expression also increasing when you combine them together. So this is still a work in progress, but it, it provides some really important information. And the other thing that we did is we showed that uh, on ELISA's that we can get the uh, autoantibody binding to recombinant grip on a plate. And we also showed that the recombinant antibody binds to grip 78, and it doesn't interfere or the uh, anti-grip 78 autoantibody doesn't interfere with it. So what that says to us is the epitopes are different in these molecules. We know the epitope here is from 98 to 115, whatever it is uh, in the end terminus. And the recombinant antibody, we don't know where it is. Amgen never studied it. The group that, that generated this PAT SM6 antibody never studied it. So that's one of our important um, um, aims is in the next near future is to identify the epitope where this recombinant antibody binds. Um, so we do have a little bit of evidence. There is some evidence in the literature suggesting that this recombinant antibody, this PAT SM6 antibody, binds somewhere in the ATPase domain of GRIP78. And we made a peptide. We only have one peptide now, which suggests that higher concentrations, you can see a reduction in the ability of the recombinant antibody to bind to the uh, recombinant human grip on a plate. So we're still look, looking at this. This is a 19 amino acid peptide. I can't tell you much more than that. Um, so what might be happening? It might be that the dual antibody, when they're bind one to the N terminus, one to the C terminus, may be reducing 
these pathways while activating the apoptotic pathways. So that's something we're going to look at. We think that somehow this combination of antibodies is sensitizing the tumors. Uh, so again, you know, we have tools to identify the recombinant antibody. We now have enough of the recombinant antibody from Amgen. And now we're doing a number of uh, assays using either blots or uh, activity assays to identify the pathways involved here. And then uh, last but not least, we're making uh, recombinant human grip, truncated fragments of recombinant human grip to use in our ELISAs to see which recombinant fragments are still able to bind the recombinant antibody and which ones don't. So this is a pretty straightforward uh, process. And then, you know, we've got recombinant human grip, which is functionally active. It's got ATPase activity. It's beautiful. It's, you know, it's not degraded or anything like that when you purify it. So we're very confident we're going to get a number of these uh, fragments of GRIP78. And we'll be able to, I think, eventually identify the, the site where these recombinant antibody bonds. And last but not least, uh, we've been working with a company called Atomwise. And what Atomwise does is they use AI to, uh, to identify uh, how molecules, chemical, small chemical compounds, can bind to your target of interest. So what they do is they take 7 million, I don't know, small chemicals that are known, and they take your protein of interest, uh, the 3D structure, and they identify which molecules can potentially bind and in which regions of GRIP78 for us. And then they give you this sort of 70, 80 compounds. And they say, here's our highest binders. Do what you want with them and let us know how it works. And then maybe we can sign a contract later. So that's what we did is we made, uh, uh, ask them to identify these uh, GRIP binders that bind to this epitope uh, where the autoantibodies bind and they, shipped us and gave us 70 of these antibodies, further look at where these uh, molecules bind in GRIP78. And then we know it works because we actually have a paper that's uh, uh, in review and we've shown that some of these molecules can actually block the ability of the autoantibody from binding to GRIP and affecting tissue factor procoagulant activity. So we're pretty excited that some of this stuff is actually working. And this is what we think is happening here. The grip binder interferes uh, with the uh, autoantibody binding at that 98 to 115 domain within GRIP78. And again, the same type of pathway, calcium is released, activates tissue factor, increases thrombin in cells. And then uh, just finally, a couple molecules we've shown just independently from the atom Y screen if you just give them an increasing concentrations to our DU145 cells, they actually cause cell death or increased uh, cytotoxicity. And here's another molecule that does it even better, uh, although the concentration is quite high, and we can modify the molecule if we have to. And uh, last but not least, there's a, a study that was done by Edward Lin in my lab. And what he showed quite interestingly is we have some of these compounds, here's 2202, uh, alone doesn't do anything. But if you add the autoantibody, just the autoantibody itself, plus that compound, you get a significant increase in cytotoxicity. So we might be lucking out here. We might be able to find some compounds in combination, here's another one, 2203, that in combination with the autoantibody, causes cancer cell death. So to us, that's very exciting because it suggests you need the autoantibody there in order to initiate uh, increased cell death. And uh, that's really it. Thanks very much for your attention and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much, that was really interesting. Do you have any questions from the audience? Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. We know the ATP is, is active when it's acting as a chaperone. Now, how do we find out functionally whether the ATP ACE activity has an effect on, on surface grip 70 is a, is, a, is a very important question. So the idea would be that we know from Amy Lee's group, they've modified the ATP ACE domain and grip to, to basically um, eliminate ATP ACE activity. So could we now take a recombinant grip overexpressed to get it to the cell surface that has no ATP ACE activity and find out whether the autoantibody binding it or something else binding it has some type of effect. So that's the problem that we have right now because we're talking cell surface grip, which may have to totally different protein interactions and binding partners and activity versus uh, endogenous grip, is it, which is a chaperone. So. Yeah. You indicated that the antibody was associated with worse prognosis. Yes. The antibody also can have an antigen effect or maybe with other players. The, the, is there a paradox there? Or no, the autoantibody has pro tumorigenic effects. The recombinant antibody that we got from Amgen has this anti tumor effect only when you add it with the autoantibody. Well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, uh, so, sometimes things are counterintuitive and that's why we do the experiments. So again, what we're trying to do is to see whether the recombinant antibody is sensitizing the cell to these pro-epoptotic pathways versus the proliferative pathways. So that's where we stand right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. What we do is in patients, as I mentioned, the vast majority of autoantibodies are against the N terminal domain. And the original paper, ARAP and Pasqualini's paper, they identified um, this uh, small peptide in their phage display that bound to the autoantibody. It's a cyclic peptide, which they said in their paper is folds almost identical to the 98 to 115. So the autoantibodies that we purify are just those N-terminal antibodies. Now, if you took recombinant grip, you could purify 90% of those autoantibodies and 10% of C-terminal antibodies if you wanted to. But that's a very good important point is we only isolate the autoantibodies which cause tumor cell proliferation and tumor growth. And that's why the heparin works because the heparin binds to that domain, all right? It may not bind to any other domain, but we know that's where the heparin binding domain is in GRIP78. Yeah, so, so what we did is we, when you add the autoantibody, so we'll take cells, you know, we'll fix them, and then we'll add the autoantibody plus or minus heparin. And if you have the heparin around, the autoantibody doesn't bind, we can't detect it, okay? So that's how we showed on the surface that the autoantibody was not binding. But in your proofs, you know, you was this a neuroendocrine model of prostate cancer? Uh, no, basically it was a model system where we took the DU145 cells, injected into the flank of the animal to allow for the tumor to grow. So we haven't done that. These are things that we need to do. The other thing we don't know is whether the immune system is involved in this whole process as well. But that's a very good point. I mean, we need to, you know, enhance our model systems to look at the immune versus immune independent effects of this of this uh, autoantibody as well. Yeah. I said it, but I'm not sure how many patients with prostate cancer actually present with those autoantibodies. Does that relate in any way to antigen dependence or independence? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I mean, every patient, well, the patients that we get the autoantibodies from are ones that are going <coughs> to, excuse me, 
are ones that are under going to be undergoing surgery. So they're, you know, probably stage three, stage four individuals. So every one of those patients have, you know, well over a hundred micrograms per mil of the autoantibody. So whether it's related to their androgen state is we don't think relevant because it doesn't matter which patient we get them. And if you measure their androgen status, it doesn't matter. The autoantibodies are still high in every one of those patients. Okay. So you mentioned that there's some surface expression. We don't, we don't have it in normal cells. But That's right. Have it, uh, other types of cells. Uh, during viral infection, also, the immune boost machinery produces a lot of progenies and a lot of cells. Does viral infection also lead to this sort of surface expression? Uh, absolutely, it does. And if you look at all the recent COVID papers now, uh, there's well evidence, you know, well identified evidence to show that viral infection, it's already known that viral infection causes a UPR, causes ER stress, and that does lead to surface expression. Now, what we don't know is what would be interesting to figure out whether those patients have autoantibodies. Maybe there's a long COVID effect and you've got this autoantibody and, you know, more viral infection and more cell surface. And, so that's something that it would be nice to look at some patients to see what their autoantibody titers are like and whether that correlates with either an effect and a, a deleterious effect or, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is there any thought, oh, sorry. You want to go first? I was just wondering, has there been any thought to, you know, keeping one of the antibodies fixed, titrating the other, and then reverse to see if we have insight into? We get the reviewer on our, our grant. <laughs> <laughs> That's something a reviewer would ask, but you're right. Sorry, I mean, so, so the question is, what's, what's the critical uh, mm -hmm. amount of uh, the ratio of the antibody to, and, and just, I didn't tell you, but the concentration of the autoantibody that we use is considered a pathological concentration. 60 micrograms per mil is what we use. Anything below that, we do not see any effect of the autoantibodies on tissue factor procoagulant activity. Now, we use a two to one ratio. We use a two to one recombinant antibody to the autoantibody to get this effect, but we haven't really yeah. manipulated that yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. I mean, apparently there are some glycosylation sites in GRIP that may be modified when it gets to the cell surface. That's one thing, but that's a whole black box that people have really not been able to to uh, tackle yet. It's like, how do you define what a surface GRIP is versus what the uh, endogenous GRIP is? And I think maybe I'm not smart enough to do that, but you know, it'd be nice to try to tease out what is the difference between these two? Are they folded differently? Are they interacting with different partners? You know, I mean, GRIP is con called heavy chain binding protein for a reason. It binds to IgG, it binds to a whole bunch of things. It's a chaperone, so we know it'll interact with a bunch of things. But that's a great question. Any questions on San Francisco? I think that's in the interest of time, and it's been a lot of interest from the crowd. So, thanks a lot, everybody, and thank you very much. That was really intriguing. All right, thank you very much. Nice to see you again. Have a great yeah. dinner. Yeah, are you? Let's get together. Yes, come on over. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Radio is pretty uh, just nice. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were coming, so I wanted to make it laugh.